It's been quite a few weeks now. You know, right? Just like it's been forever. It's been forever. What do we even do? No, I'm just kidding. Okay, so uh, we asked the question a couple – well, it's been a couple months now uh, – about um, what about good people and that kind of stuff. And so we're just going to spend probably two weeks is what we're looking what's, – what's supposed to be. I hope that next week's lesson doesn't go longer than – I mean I hope that this uh, little series or whatever doesn't go more than next week. But I guess we'll just see. Projectedly, <laughs> that's when it's going to end. How can God send good people to hell? This is a very weighty question, um, something that I think rests more in our misunderstanding more so than God's quote-unquote injustice. Now, some people have said, and I think that there is, from a certain point of view, a certain – okay, I understand it. We're, we're, God doesn't send anyone to hell. You know, People reject him, and they send themselves to hell. Well, okay, all right, but at the end of the day um, – as far as I understand it, God is the one who has established heaven and hell, which would mean that that's just kind of rewording it. And yeah, I understand that you know God has made a way out, and I think that's the good part of what that's saying. But let's look at this. So how can God send good people to hell? Well, first off, the question itself is wrong, and the reason why it's wrong is because what I'm really saying is Jesus isn't really necessary. I can be good enough on my own. Um, you know, if I just do enough good stuff, I don't deserve to go to hell because I, I'm, I'm, I'm therefore righteous. See what I mean? Uh, that's what I'm really saying by saying, how can God send good people to hell? I'm saying that there's a certain people who don't need Jesus. They're good enough. They can earn their way to heaven. Well, now see what I'm saying? The question itself is faulted. What I'm also saying by asking the question of how can God send good people to hell is God has to answer to me. God has to do things that I like in a way that I like. He has to answer to me. Everything that he does, I have the final say on it. Well, so then I'm making myself God. I am therefore God and the standard of right and wrong. It's not right for God to do that. See, now God has to answer to me and my standard of right and wrong. So then that, that, is a, that brings up a really foundational problem. Who is God? Me? Someone that I have invented? Or is there an objective being out there? not related to my own personal bias, who is God? And that's really the root of this question. It's a question that has no right answer because it's asked from a wrong heart and a wrong motive. So the false perception that we have in all of us, some, to different, different extents, but in all of us, is that there are some people who are sinless, some people that we see above imperfection, above sin. For some people, it's their sweet grandma. For some people, it's Mother Teresa. You know, everybody has their own person in their head that when they think of, they think, oh, that's the perfect person. Maybe it's ourself for some people. Um, I'm definitely, I've never been in that place before. Um, I'm, <laughs> uh, yeah, definitely not there. But some people, you know, uh, they say, well, I'm good enough, and they just leave it, leave it at that. Uh, but this false perception um, really is in all of us to, to different degrees. Um, and basically what we, what, we, what we have here is this idea that, well, they're better than Hitler, right? So Mother Teresa, here she is, and I mean here's Hitler over here. So I would say like Mother Teresa, she's like probably perfect or something, and then Hitler's probably like Satan or something. So okay, there we have good and bad. See what I mean? And so now we have this perfect little world where we can say, how can God send good people to hell? So let's look at some parts of what the Bible has to say. And I think that these four verses have really been foundational for me. First off, there's the issue of before we're saved, and then there is the issue of after we're saved. So let's look at before we're saved. Romans 3.10 says, As it is written, there is no one righteous, not even one. So that kind of does away with the whole conception that we um, – so, sorry, false perception that we, that we looked at here about some people being sinless. And about how God has to answer to me and how Jesus isn't really necessary. There is no one righteous, not even one. So then we look at Romans 5, 8, the same book, just a couple chapters later. But God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. So, so we didn't do anything to earn God's forgiveness. Okay, all right. So then that takes us to 1 John 1, 8, which is written to Christians after the fact of being saved. So surely we think somewhere in us, okay, 
So the world is full of a bunch of bad people, but except for Christians. Christians are good people. Okay. This is just an idea that we have in, in our head somewhere. I don't know exactly where it came from. But uh, so so here's that. But let's look at what 1 John 1, 8 actually says. If we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. We're talking about Christians here. Christians are not good either. So then we get down to 1 Peter 3. Well, hold on. Before I say that, this is where the club mentality comes from in, in churches. Let me come right back to that because I want to. I want to. I, I don't want to get on rabbit trails, and I think that if I say that, say that now, I'll, I'll get off on a rabbit trail. First Peter three eighteen says, "Christ suffered for for our sins once for all time. He never sinned, so he is the only one who is sinless. But he died for sinners to bring you safely home to God." Now this is why why I have safely um, emboldened there on on the on the PowerPoint is because this doesn't mean that we will not have any problems on this earth or that we won't face sufferings that kind of stuff. What it means is that we will arrive at heaven. We won't get lost along the way. Our salvation is secure. When we die, God's not going to like, oh, where did they go? Like lose track of us. You know, we will arrive safely in heaven is basically the idea here uh, to bring you safely home to God. Not that we will have safety here on earth, <laughs> but that God will carry us there safely. Okay, so he suffered physical death, but he was raised to life in the spirit. And then that goes to a whole other thing, which you're just going to have to read First Peter 3 to get the whole idea of what he's talking about. But, I mean, that pretty much summarizes it. So here, this takes us to a deeper problem that really permeates a lot of Christianity. Um, Christianity for the past hundred years, Sunday school, um, uh, kids church. This is a this is a problem that really permeates uh, Christian environment, uh, whatever you want to say. What do we teach our kids? What do we always emphasize in lessons? What are most self help, even religious self help help books about? How to be a better person, right? And there's the problem. How to be a good person or a better person. We, we dedicate Sunday school, devotions, everything's dedicated to this. How to be a better person. So then, what is the, what is the idea? Christians are expected to be better. It's not about us being forgiven. It's about us being better. better. And here is where the club mentality comes in in Christianity. Because if you're not good enough, you don't belong here. So you have to become good enough so you can belong here. Do you see? And all that that's done is based off of a misconception that we have about our goodness as Christians and pride and arrogance. I'm so good. Look at me. And this is exactly the opposite of what Christianity is about. So we're going to look at a few things that are hopefully will clear up that misconception and we'll be able to really answer the idea of what about good people? How can God send good people to hell and whatnot? So... Christians are expected to be better rather than being forgiven. And look at it like this. Somebody comes into your church, right? They're judged because, I don't know, whatever. Uh, maybe they just look kind of like a thug or maybe they have a lot of tattoos or they cuss a lot or something. Some reason, you kind of get a little bit of like, Ugh, I don't want this guy around my kids, right? So um, then what, what do they say? They say something like this. That guy goes to church here. He's no better than me. He goes out drinking with me. To see what's just happened? Now, that person is judging those in the church by the same standard that the church has just judged him. And therefore, you have a repeating cycle of Christians looking down on people that they should be loving and non-Christians picking up that signal and saying, Ah, I'm being judged, not loved. And so then what happens is they, they take that and say, You guys aren't good enough. You guys aren't good. So you guys are judging me for not being good enough for your club, but I know you guys. You got a bunch of sinners in your church, Pastor. See? Very unhelpful. So the message is that Christianity is about being a good person. Well, let's think about this reasonably. Reasonably, If Christianity is about nothing more than being a good person, why waste your time going to church? Why waste your time reading the Bible? Like, I can be a good enough person on my own. It's just about being a good person. Oh, I don't even need Jesus. See what I mean? And that, that's a lot of what our, once again, Sunday school classes are about, A lot of what a lot of sermons are about, what a lot of children's church uh, curriculums and stuff are about, how to be better, how to be a good person. And it's not that there's anything wrong with, you know, not being a bacteria to society. 
There's nothing bad about that. But that's not the heart of Christianity. Our kids mess up and what do we do? Do we show them the love and forgiveness of Christ or the judgment of the world? When we teach them things, are we teaching them eternal truths or are we teaching them things that are more based off you, you kind of get what I'm saying here maybe so the message is that Christianity is about being a good person but Christians aren't any better than the world and even if Christians were better than the world most people don't need a guilt trip to be a good person they think I could go to church and be be given the guilt trip about how I need to do all these things and give tithes and Spend more time at church and uh, all this stuff for the uh, for other people. Or I could just, hey, I'm a pretty good person. I don't even need any of that. And that's not even the issue. Christians have made people reject church because they've made it about being a good person when that was never even supposed to be the issue. Therefore, if this is the message that Christianity is about being a good person, therefore, Christianity is ir irrelevant. Except for those who aren't very good. So let's say like, okay, Christianity really isn't for me, but Nicole, she's kind of a screw up, so she needs Jesus, but I really don't because I'm pretty good by myself. Like, I didn't really need it. And even then, there are other options. Like, maybe Nicole needs Jesus or maybe she needs Buddha. I don't know. It doesn't really matter. It's all up to her. See what I mean? Because it's just about being better. So whatever floats your boat to help you be a better person, then that's it. So then what does the Bible have to say about about this okay this is from luke 18 19 this was so to me when i first read it i i didn't I, I i i knew this verse and yet i never really got it why do you call me good jesus answered listen to this no one is good except god alone now some people say oh he was saying that he wasn't really god no no he's not you've got this person he walks up and he thinks he's pretty good because you can tell this if you read the rest of the conversation. He says, I've kept all these commands. I've done everything right. I'm a good person. And then he goes up to Jesus and says, hey, good teacher. See, he didn't understand good and bad. Much like the Christian church today doesn't understand good and bad. We think we're good because, oh, I'm a Christian. I'm better than them. I've never done those things. You know, there's child molesters over there and then there's me. I mean, I just do a few wrong things here and there, but I mean, I'm good. I don't really need Jesus, but he's lucky to have me anyway. So, you know, <laughs> and uh, so we all as Christians have this somewhere in the back of our head. I don't even know necessarily where it came from, but this idea that, yeah, I'm good. So then we look at what Jesus says here. Why do you call me good? No one is good except God alone. He did not say that his followers were good. So let's take this. Let's take this apart. OK, first off, the guy was trying to be good enough. Instead of following Jesus. And he didn't want to give away what captivated his heart, which was all of his things. But had he given away all those things like Jesus advised him to do, he would have been able to follow Jesus and learn that it wasn't about his goodness. But because he wasn't able to give up his things, he was caught in the rut of trying to be good enough and never being good enough. He was miserable. He went to Jesus to try and fix it. Jesus told him how his heart was captivated. That's the issue. And he wasn't willing to change it. So he went away sad. So the guy was trying to be good enough. Jesus was God. But the guy didn't realize it. The guy didn't call Jesus good teacher because he realized who he was. He called Jesus good teacher because he thought he knew what he was instead of realizing what Jesus was. He thought, oh, I'm good enough. And Jesus seems like he's pretty good too. So he didn't call Jesus good teacher because G he realized Jesus as God. He, he thought that Jesus was on equal par with him. I'm pretty good and you're pretty good. What am I doing wrong? And that's the heart of the question of why Jesus said, why are you calling me good? You're comparing me to you. And that's not how things are going here. Not even God's people are good. Realize this. At this time, the, the Christian church didn't exist, but God's people still existed. Okay? And Jesus doesn't say no one is good except for God and his people. He says no one is good except for God alone. What that means is that God's people, Christians today, are not good. This completely changes everything. 
of how we are taught in televangelists and in a lot of Christian literature, only God alone is good. So let's look at 2 Corinthians 5.21. God made him who had no sin to be sin for us, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. In other words, we cannot become the righteousness of God without him. That is the assumption there. This is some, not something that we can do on our own or apart from him. So let's look at this practice and in, in futility. Let's ask a couple questions and really think about it. I, I'm not looking for answers. I, these are just a series of questions I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ask and kind of elaborate on. And I want you guys to think while I'm reading through them. First off, how much good do you have to do to outweigh the bad that you've done? Like, how, do, how does the scale work? Now, think about this. If someone murders someone else, how long do they have to do good things and how many good things before that person is no longer dead? Well, that person will never be undead. You've killed them. They're, they're dead. No amount of good things undoes what has been done. But in our society, we're taught these are the bad things, and they're kind of building up, but you got to just do good things. What if the good things, you can't make them add up as fast as the, as the bad things are adding up? Think about that. I mean, that's a scary thought. What were you going to say? The first analogy I think of when it comes to that is weighing bricks and feathers. It takes a lot of feathers to amount to one book. Mm -hmm. And it's never going to weigh the same. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that, that's true. And so the, the, the thing being, no amount of good will undo that, 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 that murder that, that that person has done. And it's not going to bring that person back. And so therefore they will always be guilty. Let's say, for instance, let, let's throw out another, another hypothetical. Hitler has killed all these people. Mass genocide, and then he, and then he's like, you know what? I'm done killing people. I, I'm gonna go do some good things. Yeah. And so then everybody says, hold up, everybody, you can't, you can't get Hitler in trouble. He decided to be a good person now, and he's making up for the bad thing. Those people are still dead. Like, what are you? There's nothing that can undo that. So, what bad things count on the tally of good and bad? Which specific things? Do bad thoughts count, or is it just things that people see? What if you don't even realize that you're having a bad thought? You don't re recognize the thought as being bad. Does it still count as bad even though you don't recognize it as being bad? Um, you remember, just, just think about these. What, what about unavoidable things? Like, for instance, Eli has a new, a new, a new hoodie. And my first thought when he, when he – oh, man, I, I want that hoodie. Jealousy, right? That's not something that I had to premeditate. That's something that comes naturally. Um, that so so that's kind of unavoidable. What about greed? Let's say Nicole's freaking loaded, dude. She's got like money coming out of her ears, okay, out of her nose whenever she coughs. You know, quarters come flying out, and she's just filled with money. And I get like, man, I, oh, and like my my initial response is, how come I don't have that? I didn't even have to think about it. it just came to my head. You know what I mean? Well. Those are unavoidable things. What about unavoidable things? Do they count too? Or can I just say, you know what, that bad thing isn't really that bad because it's, it's just who I am. What about addictions? Things that, like, you you need this. Okay, let's say, and let, let's, let's really broaden this. Let's make it not just about drugs. Let's make it about really anything. Maybe I'm addicted to, you know, um, uh, attention. Like certain little girls right now. <laughs> Talking about my daughter, um, uh, you know. So what? What about addictions? Things that things that I, I have become dependent on. Um, what about attitudes that I continually deal with? What if I? What if like deep down inside I, I kind of secretly hate Isaiah and I'm just like ah. And so I'm like okay, I've gotten over it. I, I forgive you, dude. Or, or maybe you didn't do anything wrong. You're just my problem. So I just like okay, okay, it's not that big of a deal. And then I'm like ah oh, no oh I see him again. And I'm just like ah oh, I hate him so much. What if I'm continually dealing with that? Do, does that does that bad attitude count as one big thing, or is having a bad attitude not that big of a deal, or is it multiple small things like every single time that I that I have a bad attitude towards you that counts, or is it every second that I have the bad attitude that counts? See, I mean, how is it how is it tallied up? See what I mean? Oh, going back to the whole example of murder, if I murder someone, does it matter how long I take to murder them? On the tally, just think about this. The tally system is kind of 
broken in itself if you think about it so then that brings us to a bigger question every everybody's focusing on being good or bad i'm a good enough person how can god send good people to hell here's the here's the root of that problem and th this is what a lot of these questions come down to what makes something good a lot of times people go oh i'm a good person how do you know what is good once again don't not looking for answers just think about this what is good and why is that good for a, for a lot of a lot of the discussions and philosophical you know beliefs out there are more based on the we all know what good really is do we do we really and do if, if we do know what is good do we actually follow that or do we say well i have an excuse for why i don't have to be held to that standard by whose standard is something good or bad let's think about this the different cultures have different laws people change society changes people are often wrong they believe something and then later they'll believe something else what is good and why is it good? And these are things that can't just be ignored and set aside. So, so then there's there's this there's a series of, of answers that people have tried to come up with by their own understanding. The first one is: so long as it hurts no one, do do what thou wilt, do whatever you want, as long as it hurts nobody. The problem with this is that it's what's called untenable. It's uh, let me say it, diff say it differently. It is an impossible standard. Let me give you let me give you an example of how how hurt how you you said so long as it hurts no one hurt how are we talking about only physically hurt or are we talking about spiritually hurt because that's pretty subjective to the person maybe for instance uh, if you read the book of 1 Corinthians some people were getting spiritually hurt by eating meat that had already been sacrificed to idols and some others weren't Paul didn't seem to mind but some other new Christians did so what was hurtful to one Christian wasn't hurtful to Paul. Well, what about drinking? Maybe, I, maybe I'm a serious al alcoholic, and so I really just can't even, like, I can't even drink cough syrup. But then Isaiah, for instance, he's just like, no, I casually drink, and I never really get drunk, and, you know, I, I don't really do anything stupid. I, I never go to ex excess. So what if that's hurting me, though, and it, hurt, and it causes me to get drunk? Well, is that even his problem? These are these are all things. So much as it hurt, doesn't hurt, but hurt how? Physically, spiritually. Here's another thing. Are we talking about hurt them spiritually in the sense of relative, like what hurts them inside? Or are we talking about in the grand scale? Like, for instance, let's say I tell, Isaiah, I tell Nicole, Nicole, you can believe whatever you want. That's hurting her spiritually because that's not true. You can't live however you want. There are consequences for actions. So I have just unintentionally hurt Nicole, or maybe intentionally. <laughs> um, or are we talking about emotionally hurting? Once again, this is pretty subjective. Maybe uh, I, maybe Eli gets his gets his feelings hurt if I if I hate his shoes, and maybe Isaiah doesn't care what I think about his shoes. So th this is something that is very very difficult. And here's what makes it even more comp complicated: What if it hurts me? Since I am also a someone, once again, what if it hurts me physically, emotionally, or spiritually? What if it doesn't hurt me now, but it will hurt me later? Like, for instance, smoking one cigarette's not going to do that big of not going to do that big of harm. Smoking cigarettes for years has a cumulative effect. Okay, uh, and then that brings up another question: Why does it matter if it hurts someone? I know that people say, "Oh, so long as it hurts no one, what does it matter if it hurts someone?" So, science doesn't doesn't tell us that it has to not hurt someone. So why does it matter if it hurts someone? I mean, we're all just evolved beings, right? What does it matter? It always throws me off when people who believe in evolution and all this stuff are worried about global warming because I'm all like, it'll work itself out, guys, right? It'll just evolve to adapt to the higher temperatures. <laughs> Anyways. So then another variation of this is, okay, just forget the whole so long as it hurts no one. Do whatever you want. Well, so that is another way of saying that everything's relative. And the problem with that is that that would mean that child molest molestation, sex with animals, murder, stealing, they, none of those things are really wrong. All that it is is a projection of someone else's opinion. So when we're asking the question, 
what is good enough? What is someone being good? How can God send good people to hell? We have to go through all this muck that we like to put in these little categories and boxes in our head and push them out of mind. Out of mind, out of sight. It's not, it's, not, it's not a big deal. I don't have to think about it. All that I have to know is that I'm a good person and I don't deserve to go to hell. See, I mean, if you're gonna if you're gonna go to such extreme conclusions, there needs to be some thought on your part. So then, that brings us to the third thing that people say. Now, before I before I bring it up, I want to just point this out: all sins are not equal. Okay, uh, abusing a child is obviously worse than telling a white lie. However, all sins equally separate us from God. So there is that. Now, let's go to the third thing that people say. Is being good, is it about keeping your own conscience clean, or is it about reality? Now, you might say, what's the difference? Let me explain. You may not feel bad about something that you should feel bad about. I have known a lot of older Christians who have really bad attitudes. They should feel bad for having those bad attitudes. They've been saved long enough to know better, but yet they don't. So is it about them keeping their conscience clean so long as they don't feel bad about their bad attitude? Or is it about the reality that they have something bad that needs to change? So whichever one of these three things you go to, so long as it hurts no one, do whatever you will, or do whatever you want, or, hey, as long as my conscience is clean. All three of these things fall short, and that leaves us with the problem of what is good and why is it good. And that's where we'll pick up next week. What is good and why is it good? And we'll kind of elaborate on that. Hopefully we'll, we'll end this discussion next week. I don't want to drag it out too long. But uh, any questions or comments before we wrap up for tonight? No. No? Okay.